Let's get to the word. Like I said, everybody say, don't panic in the process. Don't panic in the process. I want to I want to um, I want to build and then we're going to get to some scripture. But can I build for a second? I want to build to a place. Don't panic in the process. I don't know about you guys, but um, I tend to panic in the middle of processes in life. Um, I feel like if a doctor had the correct diagnosis, they would say I'm a professional panicker. I've got PPD, professional panic disorder. Or you could call it PPS, professional panic syndrome. And I find opportunities to panic no matter what I'm going through. And it, it's, it's really bad. And I'm just telling on myself. But I want you guys to know that before I can, I can speak something and minister something, God makes me live through it. Before I can stand up here and talk to you about not panicking in the middle of processes in life, God's like, I'm going to show you what it means before you stand up there and try to tell them what it means. But for me, i got to be honest, panic looks and manifests itself differently. Like panic is one thing, but panic doesn't come alone. It comes with friends. And panic brings along worry. It's like, hey, I'm going to make him panic, but worry, come on. Panic brings along stress. Panic brings along fear. Panic brings along anxiety. It brings along impatience. It brings along restlessness. And then panic brings along what ifs. Anyone have a bad case of the what ifs? Like you feel like God's called you to do something and you're just like, what if this happens? What if that happens? What if that happens? Well, I've got a question for you. What if God comes through like he always has? What if God, who is the one that brought you to this place, who has never failed you before, what if he just continues to carry you like the good shepherd he is? So I battle my what ifs with what ifs. But panic manifests itself different for me. Um, one more time, say don't panic in the process. I'm just kidding. You're going to say it again, but I just wanted to say that. Now, some people would say, what do you mean by process, Pastor Josh? By process, I'm talking about the different things. I'm speaking really fast. It's because I'm Hispanic and Puerto Puerto Rican and Italian. I'm speaking so fast. I need to slow down. Um, So what do I mean by process? Process would be the different things that we go through, like the cycles, like the stages that we go through. Graduates, you guys just went through a K through 12 education process, and you're at the end of one. But how many of you know, right there at the end of one, there's another process waiting right there for you, whether it's college, whether it's a trade, whether it's military, whether it's entrepreneurship. Guys, our youth group is full of young business owners. It's crazy. It's amazing. And God's doing something. It's amazing. Someone's excited about that. They must be an entrepreneur. Um, <laughs> but they, you guys just completed a process, your K-12 through education. There's another process. Um, and the thing about process and life is, like, life is full of processes. In fact, life itself is a process. Conception, birth, life, spoiler alert, death. Right? Some people say, what about eternity? Eternity is not a process because it never ends. Life is full of processes. Some of the processes we go through, I got to move quick. Um, The physical processes we go through in life, right? Like you guys, if you haven't already, you're about to go through the process of maybe like um, you, you, uh, you applied for a scholarship or you applied to get into a school. And there's the process from the point of application, from the point of financial aid, and then from the point of acceptance. Same thing with like getting a job. There's the process from the point of applying, then the point of waiting, and then the actual point of getting a job. It's a process. And like me, sometimes I tend to panic in the middle of the process. Like, man, did I talk too much in my interview? Like, did the person I paid to get my resume right, did they not really hook me up? Or did they not use the correct font? Like, I can tend to panic in the middle of a process. And, and the, the, another process that I like to talk about is, like, the process of, like, friendships, the process of dating, the process of being married, marriage. And there's opportunities to panic in each one of those processes. Can I share it with you? Because single people panic about timing. I'm getting older. <laughs> if you're a parent in here and your child is, like, single and you're the one saying hey you know I want grandkids that's a lot of pressure that's a lot of pressure and then if you're saying you want grandkids and you're not talking to them about God's formula of marriage and then that then you're gonna get grandkids out of wedlock no one's talking about that I got a purity retreat this weekend with a middle schooler so that's why okay so single people panic about timing guess what dating people panic about they panic about timing too how long have we been dating is this too long when should I propose fiancés, people that are engaged, guess what they panic about? Wedding plans. I think wedding plans have probably caused more canceled weddings than a lot of things. Engaged people panic about wedding plans. What what do married people panic about? Married people panic about each other. (laughs) Many people panic about finances. 
Many pe- married people f- panic about timing too. Like, when should we have kids? Like, is this the right time? And I want to encourage you with this. This is one of my first points. You will always find something to panic about. But I would encourage you tonight, may I submit to you, that instead of looking for things to panic about, by the power of the Holy Spirit, why not look for things to praise about? There's always going to be a reason to panic, I promise. I can think of reasons to panic right now. When you're looking at the reality and the things that you're facing in life, I could count. I could panic about this. I could panic about this. But instead of finding things to panic about, church, what if we found things to praise about? What if we found things to pray about? And I could speak to you as a recovery, as a panicker in recovery. Panic has never done anything for me. But praise has lifted me out of situations. But prayer has turned a situation around in a suddenly and an immediately. But I can sit down and panic and have a pity party and nothing changes. But if I decide to change my perspective and instead of looking for things to panic about, I say, God, I thank you that I could panic about my children, but I'm praising you that your word says it does not return void and you are calling the prodigals home. You can panic about finances. Or you can say, God, I praise you that you own the cattle on a thousand hills. You can find things to panic about or you can find things to praise about. I can panic. This is what the Lord told me. We can panic about the fact that we're not where we want to be. Or we can praise God that we're not where we used to be. It's your choice. Oh, I got one. I wasn't even using it. Thank you, though. So that's the physical. Let's talk about the spiritual, though. In spiritual, Christianity is full of processes. In fact, Christianity is a process itself. Us being more like Christ. Us being conformed to his image. The Bible says we're supposed to die daily to our flesh. The Bible says that by the Holy Spirit, we are being sanctified. That's a fancy word the old church used to talk about. Sanctification. You know what that word means? Being made holy. Holiness is still the standard for God's people. Graduates, holiness is still the standard in college. And you could be the one that stands up and says, I'm not going to go to that party because I'm not going to do that because God calls me to live holy and purity. Christianity is full process. When we're talking about sanctification, a lot of the times, you know, us as Christians are really good at judging people. We can, we can be upset when we see newborn Christians that aren't fully matured yet, and we can judge them. But guess what? They're on a different process of sanctification. And this hit me, and I'm telling you, like, the most religious of religious people are like this. Like, oh, I thought they were saved. Why are they doing that? Uh, can I share a story with you? Can I share a story with you? There was a teenager who recently, um, and this was back, not going to name names, there was a teenager who had recently gotten saved in one of our services, and then a couple weeks after that, he was in the service, and like God was moving like crazy. Like people were falling to the floor, people were weeping, the Holy Spirit was present, he was touching, he was touching people's hearts. I didn't even get to speak. And the service was over, and the guy who had recently got saved, he came over to me after, and <laughs> God was still working on sanctification, okay? Preface this. He came up to me after service and he says, Pastor Josh. I felt something during that service, and it felt beep good. Fill in the beep. This is someone that's newly saved. He hasn't had discipleship. A couple weeks newborn. Do we forget that the Bible says that you're born again? So at the moment of salvation, you're really a spiritual toddler? And there's got to be growth that takes place, and it's a process. So this was a spiritual infant coming to me after service saying, Pastor Josh, that service was blank good, and there was a bunch of other youth around him, and I could have belittled him, and I could have rebuked him, and I could have made him feel small, but you know what I did? Hey, praise God, brother. God is good. God is good. We'll talk later, though. We'll talk later, though, but, but God is good. Because people are at a different process than us. Amen? Now. There's a process of us renewing our minds. There's a process of the fruit of the spirit growing. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. It's Sunday school. Yeah, like Sunday school did that to me. But in the process of the fruit of the, our, of the spirit growing, know and understand that there's a reason he calls them fruit because fruit have to grow. It's a process. Guess what? I'm good at loving. I'm pretty good at joy. There's two fruits that God's still growing in me. 
It's called patience and self-control. God's still working on those in me, and it's a process. It's a process, and we're going through a process. When you pray and ask God for something, there's a process between the prayer and you getting what you pray for. When you get a word from God about your future, about your calling, there's a process between the declaration of the word and the destiny of the word. And there may be someone in here tonight who's in the middle of that process. And can I share with you that I empathize with you because I've been there before where you're in the middle of a word from God? He's declared from you about your future. He's declared to you about your calling, and you haven't seen it yet. You trust God, and you believe God, but it's been two years. And it's like, hey, God, <laughs> what's up? Yeah, yeah, two years ago. Remember, you, you said that to me? And I know what it's like to be in the middle of a word from God and in the middle of a process. And I want to encourage you tonight that you can spot mature believers by looking for the way they act in the middle. We're all good at acting, acting praise-filled, hope-filled, faith-filled at the beginning of a process. Like, brother, God gave me a word. He said, I'm going a, I'm to a, I'm a see millions saved for the gospel. But you're still, you're still working at the gas station and you still ain't seen, like, nothing fulfilled. And it's been years. It's good to be excited when you get the word, but it's hard in the middle. And you could spot a mature believer by the way that they act in the middle. And there's something about the middle of a process. And you know what I found is that oftentimes in the middle of a process, we meet God in the middle. We often meet God in the middle of a process. Matthew 14, Jesus, hey disciples, go to the other side. They weren't where they started and they weren't at the other side. So that means they were in the middle and Jesus is now walking to them. They had an encounter with God in the middle. Are you in the middle tonight? Jonah, Begins to pray and repent. Where? In the middle of the belly of a whale. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Begin to have an encounter with a fourth man who looks like a son of the gods in the fiery furnace. Where? In the middle of the furnace. Daniel in the lion's den. It was not Daniel that was keeping him safe. There was clearly a supernatural God that was shutting the mouth of the lions. And it was in the middle of the den. Where he met God and God showed up. Can I encourage you, if you're in the middle, according to scripture, you may very well be like moments away, feet away, inches away from an encounter with God that will shape and change the entire destiny of your life. We meet God in the middle. We meet God in the middle. Can I share a verse with you? It's like, when's he going to read the Bible? John chapter 13, verse 7. John chapter 13, verse 7. You got your, your paperback Bibles, your smartphones, your dumb phones. You got them? John chapter 13, verse 7. I want to read this to you. And I don't, I don't just want to read it to you. I want to, like, declare this thing. Because I feel like this is going to give some people some victory. John chapter 13, verse 7. Jesus makes a statement. And yes, this is in the middle of him washing the feet of the, the disciples. But I believe this statement transcends that specific situation and we can grab it and let it be prof prophetic in our life. John chapter 13, verse 7. You know what Jesus says? Hear the word of the Lord this morning. Tonight. <laughs> John chapter 13, verse 7. You don't understand now what I am doing, but you will Let that hit you in your spirit. Jesus says, hey, right now, I know it doesn't make sense. I know it doesn't add up. I know people are making fun of you because you're keeping faith in the middle of everything that's going on. But you don't understand now what I am doing, but later you will. Can I speak that over you tonight? You may not get it now, but this is where the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. I want to encourage you and say you don't get it right now, but you don't have to get it. One of the, one of the words God spoke to me in a fearless worship service was, Josh, you don't have to know how if you know who. I don't have to know how, God, you're going to work it out. But all I know is who you are, and you are a way maker, and you are a provider, and you are close to the brokenhearted, and you have always come through for me, and you've never lost. I don't have to know who if I know how. You know the thing about processes? We don't like processes in life. We don't like them. Let me prove it to you. We love microwaves. 
oh, I'm the only one to be cooking my ramen noodles and my Easy Mac in the microwave. Okay, y'all judging me. It's okay. It's okay. We use microwaves. We love microwaves. That's why we don't like process. You want to know another reason we, we don't like process? drive throughs we, you, know, you know how much we don't like process? We will call Uber Eats and delivery dudes to go through a drive through that is already fast food <laughs> and set someone else and pay an extra delivery charge for that Big Mac and fries and that cookie, cookies and cream McFlurry. We don't like process. Let me prove it. We don't like process. Let me prove it to you. Streaming services. Because we don't want to wait for the series. Like, I don't want to watch it. Man, that makes me mad now that I got streaming services when I'm watching something live. And I'm like, man, the season's over? I got to wait a year now? Like, seriously? Streaming services are proof that we don't like process. We just want to sit on a Saturday and binge watch that show for four and a half hours so we can tell our friends, we caught up. Yeah, I caught up. How'd you catch up that fast? You know, I was, I was in prayer and God, yeah, God just, I caught up. That's all you need to know. Streaming services, we don't like process. Bro, streaming services put Blockbuster out of business. The kids in here and the teens are like, what is Blockbuster? <laughs> your parents can tell you later. Ask your parents. You could Google it. It used to be a thing. As if walking down the aisle and choosing your thing and pulling up your case to realize there's not a case behind it and being upset. As if that was too much. But we don't like process. Amazon Prime. Come on, guys. Amazon Prime, as if three to five business days ain't enough. I want it tomorrow. You know they're working on one day shipping, guys? They're working on one day shipping so that I can click it right now and get it at my door later. We do not like process. But you know the thing we need to understand about process tonight? Process takes patience. And that's why we don't like process, because we have not fully manifested the fruit of the Spirit called patience. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31 They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. That's the second half of the verse. We read that and we get, Jesus, hallelujah. God is good. I want to mount up with wings as eagles. But do you know what the first part of that verse says? I want to fly like eagles, guys. I want, to, I want to run and not be weary. I want to walk and not be faint. But the first part of the verse, talking about how process takes patience, it says, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. You can't fly without the strength of the Lord. You can't walk and not be weary and run and not be faint without the strength. But we want to skip that process and we want to say, God, I want, for, I want what you have for me, but I don't want to wait in the presence of the Lord. God, I want what you have for me. I want to step into my calling. I want to step into my future, but on my time. And that's not how God operates. He says, you've got to wait upon the Lord. And once you wait, then you will renew your strength. We equate waiting with, like, no productivity. Well, if I'm waiting, nothing could possibly be happening. I went through a, uh, a stage in my life when I graduated high school and I was having, like, multiple encounters with the Lord. I wasn't working. Like, I was just like, God, you're my everything. I'm just going to give it to you. I go into my room for, like, eight to ten hours. People thought I was crazy. And I just put worship music on and I just pray and seek the Lord. And I remember someone saying to me in that stage in my life, they said, Josh, how can you possibly get anything done? If all you do all day is pray. And the Holy Spirit took that sentence and flipped it back to them. I said, how could you possibly get anything done if you don't take time to pray? Because it's in prayer and it's in the waiting that we receive the strength. We want the strength without the waiting. We want the anointing without the pressing. Psalms 27, 14, wait for the Lord, be strong, take heart. And wait for the Lord. You know when my teachers used to say something twice, I was like, that's definitely going to be on the test. He says, wait for the Lord twice in one verse. Like, God, you just repeating yourself or you really want me to get what you're saying? Wait for the Lord, be strong, take heart, and wait for the Lord. God spoke to me. He said, Josh, you need to understand that I work when you wait. Receive that tonight. God works when we wait. Are you waiting tonight? You got a word. Graduates, you got a word about your future. You got a word about your calling. God told you about the business that you're going to have, and you're waiting because you don't necessarily see it, and it's not necessarily prospering. And it doesn't necessarily have the favor you'd want it to have. God works when we wait 
and when we're faithful and when we're committed to him. Joseph waited 13 years. Abraham waited 25 years. Moses waited 40 years. Jesus waited 30 years. So what does that mean? If God is making you wait, you're in good company. David had to wait. Joseph had to wait. You know, I feel, I feel like God was saying to David, David, I just, you were just anointed as king, but yet he had to go back to the pasture. Imagine how that feels. Like, I know I'm king. This man just anointed me as king, but go back to the sheep. You know what I feel like what was happening? David had to learn how to hold a staff before he could hold a sword. David had to learn how he could shepherd sheep before he could shepherd the people of Israel. David had to learn how to sit on a rock in the field before he could sit on the throne of Israel. David had to learn how he could sit in the field with his harp and just play before God would call him with his harp before King Saul. David had to learn how to use his, his, his sling. What's it called? A, sl a slingshot. David had to learn how to use his slingshot to take the lion and to take the bear before he could be before Goliath. Why? Because God works when we wait. But will you wait so that God can work? Last thing, and I close with this. Everybody say, don't panic in the process. Without the process, guys, I want you tonight to understand Without the process of going through things, there's no testimony. And we overcome the enemy, the power of the blood, and the word of our testimony. I'll never understand. People say, man, I wish I didn't have to go through that. And that season in my life was rough. I was doing all sorts of things. And that's me. I went through a terrible season in my life when I was a teenager. I, I chased after everything, tried to fill my life with everything. I tried to fit puzzle pieces where there was a, a puzzle piece the shape of a cross and nothing else fit because my only satisfaction and completion could only be found in Christ. But people say, man, I wish I didn't have to go through that. And I'm like, man, you don't understand. Without the process, you have no testimony to share. And your te a silent testimony doesn't help anybody. Without the process, there's no testimony. Imagine if Joseph said, man, I wish my brothers never beat me up threw me into that pit and sold me into slavery. Do you know if Joseph was never beat up and sold into slavery, he never would have been the head of Potiphar's estate? And do you know if Joseph was never beat up and sold into slavery, he never would have been the head of Potiphar's estate, and then Potiphar's wife never would have tried to sleep with him and say that he did and thrown him into jail, and now Joseph's interpreting dreams. That never would have happened. Do you know if Joseph said, man, I wish I never would have been sold into slavery by my brothers, do you know he never would have became second in command in Egypt? He said, man, I, I wish I didn't have to go through that. You know, if Joseph was never beat up by his brothers and sold into slavery, he never would have interpreted Pharaoh's dreams and saved almost the entire portion of the Middle Eastern world and the nation of Israel. I wish I never went through that. No, you needed to go through that. This is why God most of the time does not lift us up out of the situation. You're like, God, take me out of this. He's like, no, I know you want me to take me out of this. That's why the, he says for the disciples, I don't pray that you be taken out of this world. I just pray that you would not be led into temptation. God isn't necessarily always trying to lift us up out of the process because it's in the process that our testimony is born. It's in the process, the Bible says, that I learn perseverance. It's in the process, the Bible says, that I learn patience it's in the process the bible says consider it pure joy my brothers and sisters when you face trials of many kinds without the process there's no testimony graduates you ready you can stand up to your feet i'm gonna say this last thing my mother in the early 2000s was diagnosed with cancer it's like non-hodgkin's lymphoma I'll never forget the day she told me when I came off the bus. I cried, scared, no faith. Only thing that I thought was, man, my mom's gonna die. What am I gonna, do? and I'm a mama's boy. What am I gonna do without my mama? You know, I never heard my mama giving pity over herself. I never heard my mama crying for her situation that she was in. Every time I saw her, she had faith. And you know, God healed her. God healed her of cancer, but do you know what was birthed out of the process of her cancer? She started a group at her church called Fighting to Win.
cancer support group because in the middle of her process, she said, you know what? It would be selfish for me to go through this and not try to help other people through when I've been through and God saved me and healed me. And she has seen dozens of dozens of dozens of people come through her group that were fighting through cancer or widows that, that, that lost somebody to cancer. And she has been able to speak life over all these people. And guess what? That group never would have been formed and those people never would have been impacted if she had never have went through once she went through. Everybody say, don't panic in the process. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you that we would be encouraged tonight that while there are things that we can panic about and while there are many, we will choose to praise and we will choose to pray. I thank you, Lord, that you're teaching us patience, that you're teaching us how to wait upon you and in that place of waiting, you will renew our strength. I thank you, Lord, that you're drawing us closer and deeper into the secret place like never before so we could declare in public what you've spoken to us in private. Jesus, I thank you for what you're doing at Winners Church. May you continue to do it, and may you touch these graduates, and may the rest of this service be anointed and be for you. In Jesus' name, can you put your hands together for the Lord tonight?